Ramallah, Yasser Arafat's besieged capital on the West Bank. Pockets hang empty. Union workers collect signatures to pressure the Palestinian Authority for jobs. We're here to demonstrate against the blockade, against the siege and the starving of our workers. Over 75% are unemployed. This is why we are demanding the Palestinian Authority finds work for people, as a difficult economic situation has led to our children's malnutrition. If you have no bread, you are forced to take the sword and attack your neighbour. The current situation is a nightmare for the Palestinians, after two years of uprising against 35 years of Israeli occupation. In the beginning, stones and Molotov cocktails were thrown, but later on, handguns and mortars were used against Israeli soldiers and settlers. And lately, suicide bombers have devastated the lives of Israeli civilians with random attacks. And from the other side, the Israeli military machine has clamped down mercilessly against the rebels and against all Palestinians in the hunt for terrorists. The amount of destruction is vast, as are the casualties, on both sides. In two years, more than 2,000 Palestinians and more than 600 Israelis have been killed. Thousands have been wounded and scarred for life. Everyone is personally affected by the ongoing atrocities. And all this is just nine years after the famous handshakes in front of the White House, handshakes which should have been the beginning of a peaceful solution to the 100-year-old conflict. But now, the hope has vanished, replaced by bloodshed. The Israeli army has moved into the Palestinian areas, which were given self-determination. They have used the international war on terror as cover. The reoccupation of these territories started in September 2000, soon after the start of the Second Intifada, and the siege is now complete. Approximately three million Palestinians are completely fenced in, entire cities, villages and enclaves are cut off. And now the Israelis are taking this a step further. A couple of months ago they started building a Middle Eastern Berlin Wall from Salem in the north until Kafar Qasem in the south. Building concrete walls, ramparts and fences with sensitive listening equipment all along the border which has divided Israel from the Palestinians since the war in 1967. The official reason is to keep terrorists out, but it badly restricts the movements of all Palestinians who can no longer freely cross the Green Line to Israel, whilst Israeli settlers are free to come and go as they please. Many of these roads are now restricted just to Israeli vehicles. Palestinians must take detours through tough terrain just to avoid going near one of the many Israeli settlements. Even roads leading out of some Arab neighborhoods in Jerusalem are blocked, areas annexed as part of the Israeli capital. Samar Daoud lives through these obstacles daily. For example, when she needs to go to the post office. The post office is only a few hundred meters from her home, but she finds the Israeli checkpoint in between very time consuming and humiliating. It's part of the occupation, reminding you of occupation, that we are here. It's disturbing because you live under it and it's like a daily practice. It's very hard to go to school because you have to cross checkpoint. It's hard to go to hospital. It's, it's very hard to cooperate through, through your daily life. So they disturb you. I mean, they, they are inside your privacy. Uh, just as you see, I, people are crossing and uh, this is the only way through your neighborhood to use. I can't see any kind of security, you know. It's for our, our, our own security we feel not good. So it's very disturbing.
and frustration. And you know, frustration causes the violence. But it's not just the siege. Following the suicide bombers, a curfew has been implemented in most of the reoccupied cities on the West Bank. The curfew is only lifted for a few hours on a couple of days a week. People have to hurry to shop for necessities before being locked up in their houses once more. The curfew creates an enormous pressure, both mentally and practically. We visit a family in Ramallah who has several generations living together. Everybody knows that we are living in a very bad situation and we should stand by each other. And for example, if I, I see my husband just bored of playing with his daughter, with her, his daughter, I should take on his side, I will play with her. If I am bored, he will take. If I don't want to cook today, he will cook. At the end, each day passes, passes. It's now something inside, you want to, uh, to break the ice and scream and do something. And yani maybe um, it's too much standing by our side. You want to do something, you want to make a fight, you want to scream, you want to make a big fight for nothing, but you want to, to get this emotion inside of you to get it out. We don't have the way how to do it. They are uh, putting curfew on us and the uh, suicide bombing are not, are not stopped up till now. I think the more they have uh, pressure on these people, let's say, uh, more, more, uh, more violence will, uh, will be uh, raised. Checkpoints are a real flashpoint for the Palestinians in their own land. And the issue of harassment by the Israeli soldiers comes up time and time again. The Kalandia checkpoint between Ramallah and Jerusalem is often in complete chaos, with mile-long traffic queues and seven to eight hours waiting for those in cars. People sometimes have to stay overnight if they do not make it across the checkpoint before dusk. Behind Herod's Gate, inside Old Jerusalem, lies a health clinic run by the UN Refugee Organization. The clinic has to serve approximately 70,000 Palestinians from the villages around Jerusalem. But it has now been made impossible for many to travel to the clinic, which used to treat 200 patients a day. These days, the number dropped to maybe to 100. But they struggle to, to come because they don't have money to go to, to doctors. Many have to fight to get through. It's hard to fence in two million people. They use tracks to get around checkpoints, to escape in and out of Israel. It still takes several hours to get anywhere, but it's often vital. According to Dr. Adele's own statistics, results are a drastic decline of health, especially amongst heart patients and diabetics who are normally attended at the clinic and given free medication. Pregnant women are especially vulnerable. Fewer and fewer are able to attend the necessary pregnancy examination. Even highly pregnant women have to walk for several hours using mountain paths. I've had a lot of pain, so I was advised to come to the clinic. It took me two hours to get here. I was humiliated on the way. I did not want to come because of the humiliation one goes through and because of the curfew. Uh, she's supposed to be 31 week pregnant. By examining her abdomen, her abdomen is large, it's 36, but uh, by the history she is a diabetic patient and she had lost three babies. And this is the fourth one. Now I have to refer her urgent to the hospital for blood sugar and maybe for premature labor. On top of all the poverty and misery, the Palestinians are watching any future country shrink more and more. Sharon's lifelong ambition has been to create a greater Israel between the Mediterranean and the River Jordan, including the occupied West Bank and Israel by allowing the continuation of colonization by Jewish settlers from around the world. I was born in Russia, sir. 
And this is Palestinian territory. This is not a Palestinian territory. This is called the land of Israel, sir. Oh. Bible it's for the past the three and a half thousand years, sir. Yes. That's right. I come from Russia, but it doesn't matter because who tells me over to Russia? Who who take us over there? It's our land. We live. We should live here. We're gone. It's no such thing like Palestinians. It's not. A, it's Arabs that come from all, everywhere. It's not such a thing like Palestinians. Shame on you. In the town this is Natanya. our land, and nobody's gonna get it. Prime Minister Sharon assures that there is only going to be expansion of settlements that exist already. But the Israeli peace organization, Peace Now, has investigated the situation and claims this is not true. New settlements are being founded despite international objections that they are illegal. The government has uh, built at least, uh, at least 60, maybe 69 is one of the figures, 69 new settlements. Uh, they claim uh, it's very often that these are simply expansions of existing settlements, but they may in fact be five, ten kilometers away. They clearly are the basis for new settlements. They have their own infrastructure and so forth. Uh, these are what in many cases we've been calling outposts, where they are really the, the basis for new settlements. Uh, there's been no freeze on building in the settlements. There's no need for these settlements, by the way. Natural growth, in quotes, uh, is more than accommodated by the flats that are already exist, the houses that already exist in the occupied territories. What is the biggest hindrance for peace, terror or settlements? I would say both. I would say both. The settlements give the Palestinians the impression that Israel is not serious about peace, and the terrorists certainly give Israelis the, the impression that the Palestinians are not serious about peace. Both are disastrous. On top of heavy human losses, the economy and the social structures have been totally shattered in Palestinian communities. But at least there is just about enough food. It's money that's in short supply. With an unemployment rate far above 50% and half the population living below the poverty level on just $2 a day. According to the UN, Two-thirds of the three million Palestinians in the West Bank and in Gaza are dependent on food assistance from international organizations. A newly released official American survey confirms that the Israeli siege has deteriorated nutritional and health standards. The American ambassador to Israel has labeled it a humanitarian catastrophe. Once I had a paint shop with 52 employees. Life was good. But today I have to beg for cigarettes from my son and nephew. I have to ask for bread from the restaurant here when they close at night. We are now at breaking points. It's hard to take this anymore. We cannot stand the situation and the lack of food. And there is no work, no money, and no medical care. The Palestinians believe that the occupation is not just for security reasons, but has a political and military goal with the illegal collective punishment of civilians in order to force them into submission. Punishment, yes, I understand. Um, I must disagree. The population, of course, is undergoing a lot of pressure. Uh, this pressure, in effect, is, is, has been going on now for quite a while, and it is the result, obviously, of uh, Israeli policies or Israeli uh, government uh, uh, decision that uh, security has to be guaranteed for Israeli citizens. Uh, the um, operations are not aimed at the uh, civilians. Uh, the declared position of the Prime Minister also has been uh, to differentiate between the civilian population and that part of the population which is actively involved in terrorist activity. Um, of course, that is a major challenge because how do you make the difference between who is a, a terrorist and who is not a terrorist when everybody is walking around in civilian clothes. And when Israelis are being targeted on a daily basis almost in the cities within Israel with suicide bombers going off almost every two, three days now. Despite the Sharon administration's wish to crush Arafat's rule once and for all, 
resistance and terrorism grow stronger. According to the Israeli army, there are more suicide bomber volunteers today than there are explosives. Sharon refuses to negotiate with Arafat and has said that the Palestinians would be beaten back so soundly they would come begging for a truce. But it seems force breeds retaliation. As long as our children are being bombed up in coffee houses while we're having ice cream in Tel Aviv, um, we will do all that we can responsibly do in order to curtail terror if the Palestinian Authority fails to do so. Yes, but you haven't curtailed terror, have you? We're trying our best. Yet another bombing. This time at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Palestinians may hold Sharon responsible because of his policies, but human rights organizations rightly call all attacks against civilians as criminal and totally unjustifiable. But can Yasser Arafat help stop the attacks? Sharon is accusing the Palestinian Authority and at the same time weakening the Palestinian Authority to the level of destroying all the civil uh, and security branches of the Palestinian Authority. So how can anybody demand and ask from an authority which had lost all its civil and uh, security services to act against terrorist attacks. Yes, Arafat, yes, Arafat, Arafat and, the and the Palestinian Authority's headquarters Afghan have been completely destroyed, the except for a small building in the middle of it all. It is the one with the Palestinian flag it is here and that Arafat and his closest colleagues have their offices. But the question is, is it just the buildings that lay in ruin? Or is the entire Arafat-led authority, including Arafat's own position, now lying in the rubble? He is certainly in the most difficult position he has ever been in. Israeli tank turrets once again point at close range on Arafat's office. But it's not just Sharon who's after him. The American president, George W. Bush, also wants Arafat out of the way. Elections are planned for January. Before this, democratic law must substitute Arafat's autocratic controls. President Bush has offered the Palestinians a sovereign state of their own but Arafat's departure is the first condition. You know, it's shameless. It's shameless for anybody to try to undermine a democratically elected president. And this is not unacceptable. But they're doing it. They're doing it, but the Palestinian people are the ones who determine and choose who their presidents are. You know, Sharon could care less if Palestinians are ruled by the Boy Scouts or Attila the Hun. It's a pretext. And to Bush, he decided to take the cost-free road, slug the Palestinians, blame the Palestinians, blame Arafat, hide behind that, and doesn't cost you anything. So it's all politics. And I'm afraid that President Bush's main item on the agenda is not Palestinian lives or Israeli lives or stability or instability of this region. It's the November elections. It's the payments for the candidates. It's the contributions. It's the internal agenda. And President Bush has no right whatsoever to hide behind who rules the Palestinians. He knows very well that the problem is the Israeli occupation. It seems Bush's demand for Arafat's departure has shaken the ruins of Arafat's headquarters, just like one of Sharon's bombardments. Having his regime on the brink of collapse and the world's only superpower as an enemy is almost an impossible challenge even for such a notorious survivor as Yasser Arafat. And he is not just fighting against his enemies on the outside. According to opinion polls, his popularity amongst Palestinians has also fallen greatly in recent months. Criticism is aimed more openly than ever before. But Arafat has not given up. On the contrary, he has declared he will stand for re-election as president. And now he has moved into the kind of fight he is best at a political battle. To meet criticism, both from the Palestinian voters and from abroad, 
He has announced the democratic reform program. After five or six years of evasion, he has also suddenly signed the constitution and reshuffled the cabinet. Even so, questions have been raised over the authenticity of his reforms, whether they are intended to increase Arafat's hold on power. The corrupt inner circle remains, and the new ministers, apart from a couple, have long been extremely loyal to Arafat. Jibril Wajub was Yasser Arafat's former security chief. He was sacked as he was seen as a dangerous rival. Since this, Rajub has not been seen in public, but he agreed to a meeting with us. I think that uh, there were uh, many fatal mistakes during the last uh, two years, but I don't think that it's the time now to say or to start to criticize what was wrong and what was right. Do you think there will be democratic reforms? Without democratic reforms, it means that we are going to bury our whole national project. We are going to lose everything. In Balata refugee camp on the outskirts of Nablus, we met one of Rajub's supporters, Hussam Kader. He is a popular leader in Arafat's Fatah organization in the large and militant West Bank. He is now one of the younger up-and-coming politicians. He has also been a member of Palestinian Authority from the start. I don't think that uh, both America and Israel from one side or the chairman Yasser Arafat uh, really uh, involved in the issue of uh, democracy. Uh, Israel and America uh, raised up the issue of democracy to stop the uprising after they fail in their uh, military attacks to destroy the infrastructure of the uh, Palestinian revolutionary uh, parties. Uh, and Israel and America, from their side, they feed the, their collaborators and uh, their uh, corrupt people among the BA through the last eight years. I do not trust in the reforms uh, which done uh, from Yasser Arafat. He uh, just uh, tried to keep himself in uh, his position. We should take care of our interior uh, society to uh, have a real institution, constitution, democracy. Without this, uh, we are uh, a mafia or a gang ruled uh, by uh, bad people. By a godfather. By a godfather. Y yes, yes, exactly. And the godfather yes. is Abu Amar. Yani, uh, sure. Kader will not stand against Arafat himself, but wants Rajub to. Rajub is not saying anything yet, but does not think his political life is finished. Will he stand against him? Listen, the issue of the election is not a personal issue. It's up to Fatah to decide who will be the candidate for the presidency. And I think that we should uh, choose the right people who can uh, meet our national needs and who can also uh, gain the, 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 the credibility on the whole uh, international community for the Palestinian people. If the voters should decide, the Intifada leader Marwan Baghouti currently has the best chance of defeating Arafat. The problem is that Baghouti is currently sitting in an Israeli prison and will soon stand trial for terrorism. There are others, but no obvious candidate, and those favoured by the US and Israel are seen by the Palestinians as having too close connections to all that is bad in the Arafat regime. The Palestinians, backed by the UN and the EU, are demanding that Sharon withdraws all troops from the occupied territories before the election can be held. Sharon says he will do that if the uprising and the terrorism stops. But despite the catastrophic situation, various Palestinian groups continue with what they call armed resistance. Can Arafat or anyone stop them? Not for, for the truth, yes, Arafat, because he controlled all, uh, could everything. He, could he tell the uh, Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade and the Tanzim, stop the fighting tomorrow no. and they will obey him? No, 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 no. He have no rule upon them, especially Al-Aqsa 
to the gates. Maybe a Tanzim, yes, because he feed them. But Al-Aqsa, no. They believe uh, uh, in the uh, armed struggle, and uh, they will uh, continue until Israel accept uh, our uh, condition, political condition. Yasser Arafat won with an overwhelming majority in the last election six years ago. He had, after years of independence fighting, finally achieved recognition for the right of the Palestinian people for statehood. And there was the hope of peace with Israel. Now, daily life is full of suffering. And the future is bleaker than it has been for years. Palestinians feel trapped. And it is Sharon who is blamed for the current situation and the Palestinians suffering. But what about Arafat? We asked a leading Palestinian peace activist and political analyst if Arafat and the Palestinian Authority are also to blame for the current catastrophe. In general, the PA was not, uh, 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 did not really achieve uh, the major objectives. And uh, if you ask me uh, what kind of uh, uh, degree I will give it uh, out of 10, I won't really give it uh, a pass. So the Israelis are not the only ones to blame for the present disaster? No, not the only ones. We, you know, share part of the responsibility. If there will be elections in January, and uh, Arafat is a candidate for the presidency, do you think he'll be re-elected? Yes. Yes, he will be re-elected because of the stupid policies of uh, uh, Mr. Bush. Because Mr. Bush, he personalized the whole situation. And his attacks against Arafat as a person forced all the Palestinians, you know, friends and, and those foes against you know, Arafat to support Arafat and to rally behind Arafat, even if they don't like Arafat, if they don't like his policies. They felt that, you know, uh, Bush was interfering, interfering in the internal affairs of the Palestinians. If uh, he did not really attack Arafat personally, and if he kept it that open so people will choose, I will assure you Arafat won't really get uh, 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 any election. <laughs>